Uh, Cancer Extremism Project is an international policy organization based in New York. Um, also got a presence in Berlin, Brussels, uh, and London as well, dedicated to finding uh, new strategies, new policies and recommendations for combating extremism in all its forms uh, and all around the world as well. So um, I'm really delighted to say that we have um, a friend of mine and a colleague. Um, hang on. Sorry, I'm getting some some trouble with the sound. Simon, can you hear me OK? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry. Some people are messaging about the sound. So that's either their system or mine. Um, I'll be on, but Simon, just give me a shout if you if you're having any trouble hearing me. Okay. Um, so as I was saying, so um, today's sem seminar webinar is called uh, "Black Flags of the Caribbean: How Trinidad Became an ISIS Hotspot." Very pleased to be speaking to the author today, whose uh, the, the book that we're discussing was published just a few days ago. Um, his name is Dr. Simon Cotty. He is uh, brilliant. We've just had a message all the way from Trinidad saying the sound is fine. So thank you for that one. Uh, uh, so so we should be good. Yeah. So Dr. Simon Cotty is a senior lecturer in criminology at the University of, um, correct me if I'm wrong, I think this is your third book after Apostates, um, which is about Muslims who leave Islam, um, ISIS and the Pornography of Violence as well, um, which came out in 2019, a collection of essays um, on, on ISIS's use of propaganda and violence and recruitment, all sorts of things fascinating and grisly read as well uh, and then like i said just literally just published this last week um black flags so we're we're very honored to have you uh, to speak about this um very luckily you, you used to live and were based and worked in the caribbean i think which is an opportunity not many of us uh, get to have um so um if you'd i guess give us a give us a some introductory remarks to the book and then we will go into uh, we will go into some questions if you're in the chat, can I just ask a favor? If you just wait until Simon has, look, if you've got a question, note down what Simon uh, has said or note down your question and then drop it in the chat afterwards because otherwise we'll lose track of the questions and it'll be hard to keep up. So yeah, so um, Simon, I can hand over to you if you like. Okay, thanks Liam for that introduction and for kindly organizing this talk. Thanks also to the Counter Extremism Project. What I thought I'd do is give, um, speak for about 10 minutes about the book and, and give a brief uh, presentation using PowerPoint. So can you hear me okay, Liam? Yeah? All right, I'm going to share my screen and go to the PowerPoint. Okay. All right, so since I have just 10 minutes, what I thought I'd do is summarize what the book is about and what I learned from doing the research that it's based on. I first started taking interest in the Trini jihadi scene back in mid-2014 when a local journalist in Trinidad, Mark Besson, started writing about it. Besson was the first journalist to identify Shane Crawford after a video emerged of him on YouTube frolicking around in the Euphrates River. I'm just going to play a quick clip from that video. So this is Crawford, this is Jane Crawford, and this was filmed probably in January 2014 when he would have been in Syria for about six weeks. And this is Crawford two years later in Dabiq magazine in which he was profiled and interviewed. Crawford was one of the first Trinis to go to Syria to join ISIS. And by the time he was targeted by a US drone strike in October 2016, he was followed by about 240 of his fellow Trinis, uh, making Trinidad one of the biggest recruiting grounds of ISIS per capita in the world. This whole story fascinated me, not just because it was about ISIS, but also because it was about Trinidad, where I used to work at the University of the West Indies. The book, which is based on hundreds of hours of infield interviews and a database of 130 Trini ISIS travelers tries to explain how Trinidad came to be such fertile soil for ISIS recruitment. With the exception of Crawford's and a handful of other Trinis, most of those who went 
to Syria and Iraq from Trinidad did go under the radar. So trying to fix an identity on these guys was like nailing Mercury. My database began with a series of perp charts, much like these, which were all over my front room, making me feel like a wannabe Carrie Matheson, a bargain basement Carrie. Every time I added a new face to the wall, it felt like a minor triumph. And the more faces I added, the more apparent it became just how intimately connected they all were. And this is a strong theme in the book. I also spent a couple of years tracking the ISIS network in Trinidad uh, on social media, which was, which was revealing in, in, in several respects. In the book, I also tried to tell the broader story of how the pro-ISIS network in Trinidad emerged out of a split within a long-standing Islamist group in the country called the Jamaat al-Muslimin, which launched a failed coup in the country in 1990. I can say more about this later. So what are the big takeaways from the book? Well, instead of just reiterating key data points, which I think would be boring, what I thought I'd do instead is rapidly summarize what I learned from researching a violent extremist network in a conservative and tropical country. One thing I learned quite early on is that it's not a good idea to wear effeminate ankle socks in the research field or, or in fact, any kind of field in Trinidad. I spent a lot of time in houses and places of worship with my shoes off. And while ankle socks might work on the streets of Milan or Paris, uh, they're not a good look in, in Trinidad where they're rightly and justly frowned upon. The second thing I learned quite quickly is not to eat street food prior to doing an interview. I, I won't elaborate on this. And if you do eat street food in Trinidad, it's always advisable to use a trusted vendor and, and to tone down on the hot pepper sauce. In Trinidad, doubles, which is made from curried chickpeas, is a common breakfast. And anyone who's visited Trinidad or seen uh, the Anthony Bourdain episode on Trinidad will all know all about doubles. Don't, don't eat doubles before an interview. Uh, the third thing I learned is that when you're doing field work in dangerous neighborhoods, it's always good to maintain a sense of perspective and to defer to local knowledge. When I went to Crown Trace to interview the mother of Shane Crawford, my cab driver, who clearly had aspirations to be the Trini Lewis Hamilton, reassuringly told me that it was far more likely that we'd get involved in a fatal car accident than get shot at by any of the warring gangs in the town. I think it's always good to have that crucial bit of context and, and nuance. On a more serious note, what I learned above all is how strange the ISIS phenomenon is in Trinidad. And I try to capture some of that in the book. Strangeness is a rich theme in Graham Wood's superb book on ISIS, The Way of the Strangers. And anyone who spends any amount of time looking at the Trinidad case will be, will be struck by its idiosyncrasies. In Rao Pantin's lovely book on, on the 1990 coup, Pantin describing the jam militants wrote, quote, these were not your average, don't give a damn. Trinidadians, these men were about serious business life and death business. Pantin suggested there was something profoundly un-Trinidadian about the jam in its dogmatism, austerity, and humorlessness. I think the same can be said of the ISIS network in Trinidad, which not only came to embrace the utopian promise or, or fantasy of the caliphate, but also to reject Trinidad for all the good things that we associate with the country, its tolerance, its democratic values, its creativity, its subversive humor, its, uh, its brightness, all exemplified in its annual carnival. And I hope to have conveyed some of, some of, some of the tensions and the kinks uh, in the book, some of these tensions and kinks in the book. Lastly, what I learned is that violent extremism is always and everywhere shaped by local circumstances. And thus any global 
theory, theory of foreign fighting or radicalization that flattens out the local dimension is bound to be limited in, in what it can explain and illuminate. I should also add that I didn't, I didn't use the word glocal, which I, which I despise. Um, and I tried to turn down on the sociological vernacular in the book as Liam uh, explained in, in his very kind review of the book, um, which he published a few days ago. The book is part essay, part reportage, part academic study, um, but I didn't want to write it as a conventional academic book. Um, and so I don't get into the weeds of any kind of academic theory. I, it's more sort of tangled up in, in more interesting weeds. Um, I'll, I'll leave you on that note and, and throw it back to Liam. I'll just get out of this. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks so much, Simon. Um, yeah, I think I, I should have mentioned that in the beginning. So just for those listening in, I, I, I very kindly was provided with a, with a, a free, I might add, free copy of the book in advance, and I have read it cover to cover and it's um i mean yeah it's exactly as you said i i i think i joked to you said um it kind of like i kind of imagined you as a bit like tintin so you called off carrie matheson but i i had tintin in my head like kind of just going around the the caribbean paradise you know sweating and on the hunt of uh of these islamist networks so i don't know i don't know if carrie or tintin wins that battle but i think that's a really interesting point to remark you know this is th there is academic rigor in this book but it but it's I, uh, you mentioned Graham Wood's book, um, Way of the Strangers. It's, I think it's more in that in that mould. Would that be fair to say? It's more like that investigative reporting kind of mould. Yeah, it kind of is. I mean, it's, it's um, well, I'd hesitate to compare it to Wood's book. Um, it's much shorter for for a start, um, but it is it's interested in 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 a story, and and I so I although it does draw on a lot of data, I tried not to get overwhelmed with the data and try and tell the story. Of how the you know the Trini ISIS Mujahideen emerged, and I try to capture some of the personalities within the net within this pro ISIS network in Trinidad. Some of the um, absurd and strange aspects of it, because it is in in some respects quite quite strange. Um, it's it was a puzzle. To, I mean, of course, it it's uh, initially strikes one as a it strikes you as a puzzle that. Trinidad is 10,000 kilometers from 100,000. Um, how far is it from Syria? 10,000 10, kilometers 10, 000, from Syria. Yeah. yeah. And so it's just, you know, surrounded by um, blue sea beaches, caliphate, uh, Calypso. Um, how, how could a place like this attract um, something as dark as, as ISIS militants? So it tries to kind of tell that story. Um, mm -hmm. So, so uh, actually, I, I want to get into. I want to ask you about Shane Crawford a bit more. But just just before we do that, I mean, I'm just looking at the attendee list. So we've got got people from London, in Trinidad, people in in the US, in in other European countries as well. So you mentioned about you know the conventional explanations, which we'll come back to as well. But what um, you know, I, I, it was a fascinating book. We've been through that. But why is it relevant? Why does it matter how how Trinidad became a kind of ISIS foothold? Um, for you know the a New Yorker, or a, a Parisian, or a Londoner, why why is that important? Do you think to study? Um, well, it's, it's an interesting test case for some of the assumptions we have about violent extremism. And um, so, if you if you kind of drill down in, into the data, then then I mean we we'll talk about Shane Crawford in a bit. But if you drill down into the data, you'll find that most of those who went were in their mid thirties. So this wasn't a uh, disaffected, disgruntled youth movement. Okay, so the average age of people who went 35 and they went, they're, they're, there was block radicalization where lots of families went. So you don't get bunches of, so Mark Sageman talks about bunches of guys. In Trinidad is bunches of families. 26, uh, as, as many as 26 families went from Trinidad to the Caliphate. And um, many women went, and there were no jihadi, so-called jihadi brides among the women who went. All of the women who went were related to the men who went. So you had these um, bunches of families leaving. 
Um, most people who went had fairly decent jobs in, in Trin Trinidad. None were poor. None were particularly oppressed. None of them, the, you know, this notion of, of um, the, the diaspora community, urban community in Western Europe, and to some, and to some extent in, in North America, that doesn't really apply to Trinidad. Um, if you look at who went, most of them went from fairly rural areas, particularly in the south of the country in Rio Claro. Most of them were affiliated to mosques, which wasn't the case in, in Western Europe. Um, so it's very different kind of dynamics. And, and so the usual discourses of push and pull that you hear about in, in CBE circles don't quite capture it. So there was no real experience of, of Islamophobia or, um, you know, kind of the, the feeling of being in exile that say second, third generation Muslims might feel in, in the European context. There's none of that in Trinidad. Um, so how do you explain it? Um, it, it it's, it's a puzzle. And so part of the book tries, part of the aim of the book is to try and unpack some of that. Um, and it turns out it's all about networks. Um, well, actually, I think, you know, just I think we're, we're a few years post caliphate now um and actually I, I kind of touched on this in the review like the there's probably not as much historical work on what actually happened as we probably need and and would like to if we want to avoid this from happening but actually the few studies that that have come out you know the real kind of you know let's build a proper database of every belgian or every frenchman or every brit it's happened more in france and belgium than, than the uk um a lot of those conventional explanations have actually fallen down even in that context so I think the, the most recent study on French and Belgian said that the the average year of birth was 1988. So that so it's it's not that dissimilar to the age range that you're talking about with the Trinidadians. Contrast that mm. to the we might think that the Shamima Begum or the Halani twins are the, are the kind of the representative, but actually there were there were more outliers than representative. Um, same thing with the with the structural factors that you mentioned, and especially uh, it, it, in the Trinidadian case. I mean. The, a lot of the explanations fall down, like you talked about the geographic clustering that that kind of rules out the the online element. Um, Trinidad doesn't have like the apart from being a colony, it doesn't have the colonial history that that France or Belgium has. It's not involved in in a military way in the Middle East or anything like that. So um, so a lot of those explanations fall down. But actually, the real efforts that have been made to understand the European phenomenon, you do see some similarities. I wonder if you can talk about that. I think. You and I are both quite critical of the vulnerability discourse in particular that, that comes around recruits. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's certainly not about vulnerability. It's not about young kids. It's not even about gangs. I mean, much has been made. There are gangs in Trinidad. There's a number of gangs. There's the Muslim Muslim gang in, in Laventor and um, there's so-called unruly ISIS in, in Central and Chaguanas. Um, these guys are involved in low-level drug dealing. They weren't, that was not, a, that is not a pathway in Trinidad to violent extremism. So if you look at all the guys who went, none of them had anything to do with these low-level drug dealing gangs. In fact, if you look at somebody like Shane Crawford and, and his crew of guys, um, Shane Crawford was the first, one of the first to leave Trinidad. He didn't, he didn't have a gang background, although he came from Chaguanas, where, where there, there are gangs operating. He was part of a different kind of crew of guys who were milder and who were dealing in selling guns and Sharia implementation, essentially, and who were incredibly pious and, and um, took their religion seriously. So if you look at the, you know, if you look at unruly ISIS and those guys in um in central Trinidad, they're, they're dealing drugs, they're taking drugs, there's a lot of alcohol, a lot of promiscuity. Um, Crawford and, and his crew of guys who were affiliated to various mosques, um, when, when, you know, they're in a different league. And so Crawford, I mean, Crawford, I'm talking about different league, Crawford and his crew pulled off a, a double murder in Chaguanas in November 2013. And that's really where the book starts. That, that's kind of the, um, the jump off point for the Trini Syrian Jihad in, in many respects. Crawford, a guy called Milton Algernon and another guy, East Indian guy called Stuart Mohammed, 
who came from a very wealthy family in Freeport in Trinidad. Uh, those were the first three Trinidadians to leave, and they left after committing a double murder. And only Stuart Mohammed was was arrested for that, and then he was put on bail. They found a, a, a bullet in in his car. He he was the driver. A guy called Milton Algernon was the trigger man, and and Crawford was alongside him. Uh, about three weeks later, they're in Syria fighting for ISIS, and they then kind of set a path for other Trinis to join them, and then facilitated that path for those mm-hmm. Trinis back um, back in Trinidad. Um, so, you know, these are not local gang bangers in the neighbourhood. These are these are serious guys. I mean, they're not holding up the Seven Eleven, you know, um, and dealing drugs. No, extremely, but, extremely pious and kind of trying to implant their worldview in a. I think there's, there's quite a lot of. Um, you talk about networks, but there's almost like kind of experimental, um, you know, physical spaces where people try to implement Sharia in Trinidad, like these Islamist communes, mm. where people actually try to Im- implement that. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that as well. Well, yeah, I mean, to some degree, in Nazim Mohammed is, um, so he's the imam of the Umar Ibn Khattab Mosque in Rio Claro. And so if you look at it geographically, about 70% of all of those people who went to Syria uh, visited at some point or were members of, of that mosque in Rio Claro. I mean, that's just a fact. And um, so he was kind of the spiritual authority for, for the whole network, really. And then there was a sub-network in Diego Martin, which was basically um, Nazim's mosque, but, but on a smaller scale. Um, and then there was another network in, in Shiguanas. And if, there was, I guess you could, Nazim's community is a, is a, kind, of, is a kind of mini caliphate, if you put it in that way. Um, where Sharia is implemented. Um, of course, there's a lot of dispute and discussion around how, how that should be implemented. Um, I think there's a, there's a but, bit in the book where you, where you kind of come face to face with him and you're kind of asking him, do you, do you really think you're, what you're doing here has got nothing to do with the fact that 240 of your citizens, most of them connected to you, uh, actually went over to Syria to kind of live in a, in a, in an operational caliphate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I went there with my uh, journalist friend of mine, Azad Ali and another friend, Umar Abdullah of the Islamic front, um, kind of helped facilitate it. And at the time Nazim's, so Nazim, this was about 2018 and it become, um, it become public knowledge that Nazim's, uh, granddaughters, so Sabira, Ada, Aziza, and Nazim's daughter Anissa Wahid, they turned up in a in a in 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 detention in Iraq. And uh, Anissa Wahid, uh, Nazim's daughter, is currently doing twenty years in 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 a jail in Iraq for joining ISIS. Um, and so I was there to interview him about about his about his grandchildren. He wanted to draw attention. Uh, to the case, I, I guess he was he was using me and Azad to draw attention to that case because we we're going to write about it. But I also um, took the opportunity to ask him about his role, uh, if any, in the recruitment of Trinis to ISIS. And he was pretty um, trenchant on the matter and said that he had nothing to do with it. He didn't know anything about it. Azad Ali pressed him and said, come on, um, you must have known something. You must have some deep thoughts about this. If you're the... If you're the man in charge of of this of this mosque and community in Rio Claro, then surely you'd know what's going on uh, in your community. Um, surely they would have had to approach you and get your, you know, to to get your uh, permission to go. But he he was completely emphatic. Said he's got nothing to do with it, and he just wants to bring his his uh, grandchildren home. But it is a fact that at least fifteen members of his family went to Syria and, and Iraq. Um, and, and so, you know, and he, you know, he, he has, he's a, he has a career in, in violent extremism, I guess you can put it in that way. He was one of the guys who, who was in the, the Jamaat al-Muslimin that launched the coup in 1990, Nazim Mohammed. Um, 
Rao Pantian in, in his book makes a couple of nice references to um, Nazim Muhammad, who has always been pretty austere and, and hardcore in his outlook uh, and pretty unforgiving. Um, but he was involved in the coup. And then when, so maybe I should say something uh, about the coup on the yeah, I was, gonna, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, so you you mentioned it briefly, um, but the actually it kind of it kind of links back to what you were saying about Crawford. So Crawford, Crawford, while in Islamic State, was was very critical of uh, Jamaat al Um but but they play quite a prominent role in your book, as in kind of you know is it almost without what happened in the nineties and without the growth of that network, would any of this happened? And just ju- just before you answer that, um, by the way, for the people listening in, if you want to, um, you should be able to send a message to panelists. So um, if you've got questions, do so. I've just had a text, um, Simon, thanking you for your sartorial advice about ankle socks in Trinidad. So um, that's that's already appreciated. Um, but yeah, maybe if you could say a bit more about the coup and the role of um, Jamaat al muslimin Yeah, yeah. Um, on on the question of of threads, <laughs> threads, um, clothing, clobber. Um, also, don't wear skinny jeans in in Trinidad. You, you will not get away with that. Um, um, Crawford, so Crawford used to use the kunya initially as Zadula, and then he he, he goes to Syria and, and finds that, finds out that Azad is an Alawite, and then and then quickly changes his uh, his name, which was a wise move, um, but is is pretty revealing nonetheless. Um, Crawford does an interview in Dabiq magazine, ISIS's. Uh, propaganda magazine in the last installment of that magazine in, in August 2016. So he threatens his his fellow Trinis. Uh, he complains complains about Trinidad being just a terrible place for Muslims, that that you are, you know, Muslims in Trinidad are living under oppression and degradation, humiliation, which is plainly bullshit because Trinidad is a is a is a tolerant country. It's um extremely tolerant towards uh, religion and, and Islam. It's a fantasy, the idea that somehow Muslims couldn't practice their deen 100% in, in, in Trinidad. It's a complete fantasy. And then he threatens his fellow Trinis, disbelievers, saying there should be war on the streets of, of Trinidad. And then interestingly, he then, he then talks about a, a group of militant uh, is, uh, Islamists in, in the country. And he's got militant in 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 sardonic sort of shitty inverted commas and he basically accuses the jamaat al muslimin of apostasy which is really which is really interesting um and i think what that speaks to is that there was a split within the jamaat al muslimin so the jamaat al muslimin was led by yazin abu Bakr, and on the 27th of july 1990 Bakr and 114 of his men um went down to the Red House, the Parliament building in Port of Spain, and then to the state-run TV station, TTT. And they stormed bo- both of these venues and then launched the, launched the, the coup. Um, Abu Bakr goes on television that night and says, um, the revolutionary forces uh, have taken command of the streets. Um, there is to be no looting. And then, of course, there was uh, it all uh, kicked off and and there was looting. There was also much liming in um, a lime in Trinidad is when you hang out and have a drink. And many Trinidads responded to Abu Bakr's call uh, to revolution by um, going out and having a drink and a, and a smoke. Um, so Abu Bakr launches the coup. It lasts for six days and five nights and then gets taken down. Abu Bakr surrenders, but he cuts a deal, surrenders, but then he cuts a deal with the government um, for an amnesty. Um, and so they, the Muslims surrender and then they get put in prison for basically two years because they get off on, on, on the amnesty and, and they get released. Um, now subsequent to that, so just after that, Abu Bakr and the Jam then, then had a, this huge fallout and Nazim Mohammed split from the Jamaat al-Muslimin because he felt that uh, Ab- Yazin Abu Bakr wasn't sufficiently sound on the creed, on, on the creed that he'd stopped giving um, Friday prayers, he'd stopped leading the mosque in, in Port of Spain. 
that he was getting involved in domestic local politics. And Nazim Mohammed told me um, that that wasn't on. And so they ceased giving allegiance to uh, Yaz and Abu Bakr. And, and Nazim split and developed his own uh, own organization in the south of the country. That's where the, the pro-ISIS network really historically comes from. It comes from that split within the Jamaat al-Muslimin. Yaz and Abu Bakr has nothing to do with the with the Trini ISIS uh, Mujahideen. Um, basically, the Trini ISIS Mujahideen is really a product of the sons and daughters of the Jamaat al-Muslimin. And in fact, the, the younger generation have, have completely split from Yaz and Abu Bakr because they think that he's not He's not, he's not knowledgeable enough about the faith. He's not serious enough. He's into all kinds of local back and out and politics. And, and so this is why Crawford says the jam are essentially apostates because they took part in democracy. They're also, um, he also criticized them for being corrupt uh, because of that. So it's not a straight line between the Jamaat al-Muslimin and, and the subsequent um, ISIS mobilization. And in fact, th there is, of course, a link in the, the Jamaat al-Muslimin sowed the seeds of, of a rhetoric of jihad in Trinidad. So they fermented this idea of jihad. Um, but they were far more interested in worldly politics and control in Trinidad. Mm -hmm. And the Jamaat al-Muslimin isn't even really, it's not a conventional Islamist group. It's more of a kind of, it provides social service. It, it's a... Um, it's a kind of grassroots enterprise led by um, Yaz and Abu Bakr that provides social, limited amount of social services and that's interested in, and is also involved in, in, in criminality, um, basically. It started off as a vigilante group doing good works on the streets of Laventor. Um, those good works, including kneecapping drug, <laughs> drug dealers, um, I'm exaggerating. I'm not sure they kneecapped them, um, but they, they they were shutting down the drug blocks. But then it changed, and they started taxing the the drug dealers uh, and started to collude in it. And it, so that's, I mean, that was the beef, partly to do with the beef between Nazim Mohammed and and Yazin Abu Bakr. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, that, I mean that's an interesting story. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, to to an extent, that you you can see similar patterns in in Europe, though. Like, you can see kind of radical or extremist groups, Islamist groups, maybe less less radical than ISIS, but you know, lay their roots down in the '90s and early 2000s, and then you have, again, like you said, it's not a straight line, but you have splinters and splits, and and these more radical factions emerge. Um, I want to come back to what you said about women, because uh, women were almost almost half of the sample, right? Oh, sorry, sample of the total travelers mm. to to the caliphate. Um, and they were, what, over 30? So we're not talking about young, impressionable teenage girls here. What what talking and what explains this? Yeah, yeah. So that's really quite striking. It's in, in the, it's about 40% 40, 40 of women. And it's striking because in, in, in Europe initially, in Western Europe initially, it was about 15% women. And then, and then, as as in 2015, as that progressed, probably went up to about 20 percent, a little bit more. But in, yeah, in Trinidad, you have 40 percent, and so, I mean, part of that is just a function of of the the kind of block migration because Trinidadians who went when most of them went in in a with their families, right? And so, that's partly interesting because. If you look at Olivia Wa's work on, G, you know, jihad and death, the idea that the the mobilisation in Europe is this death cult, it's a youth rebellion. They're they're going to Syria to die, um, and but what you see in the Trinidad case, it seems to be that they were going to the caliphate to because they wanted to remake themselves or reinvent themselves and to live an authentically Islamic lifestyle as they saw it. And so they took entire families there. And so it's interesting because there's this other, there's research on, on extremism about uh, on um, biographical availability, right? There's this, there's this notion that this idea of unfreezing, that you're not connected, that if you don't have any kind of roots or connections, if you're young, you don't have responsibilities, any ties, that this frees you up to engage in, in, a, in a violent extremist movement.
But in Trinidad, all the most of the people went had, were had families. They had roots in 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 Trinidad, and yet they still left and they took it, their whole families um, to go to Syria. Um, what's interesting with with the women? Some of the women play prominent roles in the mobilization, and so they weren't just meek little housewives who who were who just followed the dictates of their husband. One of the women is uh, Anissa Wahid, who was the wife of Daud, da Daud Wahid. Um, this is the Imam, Imam Nazim's daughter. Now, a, a security source told me that she was absolutely central in the network of, of recruiters or mobilizers in Trinidad. And... And so I think that that's kind of interesting. There were other women who went, who were pretty prominent and kind of typically uh, loud mouthed and annoying on social media, like um, Aliyah Rabdul Haq, for example, AKA Um Mohammed, who still has. I think, uh, um, I, I think you described going through her Facebook wall as a ball ache or something in the book, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just um, all the usual stuff you would expect of a. Uh, of a kind of, um, you know, ISIS propagandist. Um, yeah, she was pretty, pretty open on Facebook in relaying her thoughts about Islamic State uh, posting. She was an Awlaki fan, um, but but pretty pr pretty brazen on on social media. And so she turned up. Interestingly, she turned up in. She's in Syria right now, Aliyah Raptor Hack. She was interviewed by Jake Hanrahan of the um, Popular Front. Did a fascinating interview. He did a fascinating interview with her and Abby Green. Abby Green was the wife. She's the only Bayesian I know of who went to Syria to join ISIS. And and so Hanrahan interviewed them in in Al Hol in the Al Hol camp. And she st still seems. Um, I mean, she makes Shamima Begum seem pretty, pretty meek in, in that she was kind of openly justifying slavery or at least excusing it. Certainly, mm -hmm. so Ab Abby Green says that, well, you know, there was, it's just like slavery. Um, this slavery is not the same as, as, um, as slavery back in the day. It's a different kind of slavery. So, so it's okay. It's, it, it's Islamic slavery it's okay she says, she um, says slaves have rights and things like that doesn't she, she yeah says, oh, that, that's okay yeah they were treated with mer with mercy and then you have a leer to hack who says well you know i met this bosnian guy and he was a real sweetheart to it to the to his um two yazidi slave girls and they actually really fell in love with him um you know just c kind of outrageous stuff in in, in a way um and then Aliyah Abdul Hack says, "You know, I'm actually I'm not really that desperate to go back to Trinidad because of all, all the craziness, all the lesbianism, and all of that um, gay back and all stuff going on in Trinidad. Actually, is probably um, not that keen on going back. And again, and you know that that is that was a theme in her social media posting before she left, and it's still something that clearly resonates with her. Another guy." Um, uh, Zakir Mohammed, who is currently in Syria in a camp, said the same thing. He, he was interviewed and, and said, you know, I left Trinidad because of all the, all the disgusting permissiveness. Um, Sean Parson uh, said the same thing. Um, and so there's this ridiculous idea that Trinidad is some, some you know, hellhole, where the permissive hellhole, hellhole that, that was somehow corrupting these people that they just had to escape from it. Um, so, can I, yeah. so, so you mentioned those guys who are, you know, the, the two girls stuck in our hall and some others stuck in Syria. I mean, a, a few people have asked this and, and I think we got some emails in advance. So we know that 240 left, like um, we're, with with this time's gone really quickly. So maybe just briefly, uh, do we know how many died? Do we know how many are stranded? Do we know if any have come back? And mm. I guess the corollary to that is, if any have come back, are there any efforts to kind of reintegrate, de-radicalize what's, what's happening there? Yeah, so, so many of the guys who, who went uh, died. There's, about, there's a handful of guys I know who are still in Syria. So one of those guys is Zaid Abdul Hamid, the um, portly Trini. Well, he's no longer portly. He, he obviously, he lost a lot of weight 
uh, caliphate diet um, worked well for him. Um, he turned up in Syria in late 2018, was captured. Rukmini Kalimaki, actually, who fantastic journalist, um, wrote about Zaid Abdul Hamid, and he's still in Syria. So he, he's completely unrepentant. Um, he gave an interview to Vice, um, I think it was Aris Ruzinos, um, who interviewed him, and he said, you know, um, I didn't do anything wrong, and I was a mechanic, um, which is clearly... We've heard that uh, before. Yeah. Well, he didn't say he was a cook or anything like that. He said he was a mechanic, which is a variation on it. And then after he, was in, he was in a video, uh, official ISIS video called Flames of War, Flames of War Part 2, where he's holding the ISIS flag, um, and he's saying we're gonna we're gonna chop the head off of Trump, and you know this is a hardcore guy who who was on the front line who'd been shot in the face, completely unrepentant, and he's currently yeah he's he's currently in Syria. Um, there's a handful of other guys like him um, who who are there. I mean I could name them, but that would be a bit boring. Um, so probably about ten to fifteen Trini males are currently in Syria. Um, in terms of the women, there's about between 25 and 30 women, and then roughly about 60 to 70 Trini kids currently in, in, in the camps. So Trinidad has this quite a big return, returnee issue. And thus far, the, the, the government has been hesitant to really address it head on. Understandably, I think, the current Minister of National Security, Stuart, Ma um, uh, Stuart Young, uh, has kind of a, a avoided the subject, and um, it is a difficult subject. I mean, um, it's a difficult and, polit and highly polit politicized issue in in Trinidad. I think most most Trinidadians I've spoken to don't don't want them back, and that includes many Trini Tr Trinis from Muslim communities. They don't want them back. Um, I think that you know um, the moral. There's a strong moral case. I think well, I talk about this in the book. I think there's a strong moral case. For the repatriation of Trini children, and and also to some extent the the women, but I think there there also has to be a, a a reckoning, particularly with the women who took their children, and and also the the men if they return, um, because they essentially trafficked their children uh, to uh, a war zone to uh, you know a group that was enslaving young girls and conscripting conscripting young boys to to servitude in in a military um operation so i think that you know they need to they won't be charged on terrorism charges in trinidad because isis wasn't wasn't um recognized as a terrorist group in trinidad until I, I think september 2016 and it wasn't actually a crime to go to syria and iraq in in trinidad up until uh late 2018 so you can't prosecute them according to um, retroactively. And, and so, but I think, you know, there should be a serious investigation on the basis of human trafficking. Um, it's a complex issue because some of the children have developed, will have acquired pretty hardcore military skills. So there's a case, uh, there's a case of Emran Ali and his son, Jihad Ali. So Emran Ali was part of the Booz settlement, part of I Imam Nazim's settlement in Rio Claro the U.S. Treasury named him as an ISIS financier in 2018. Uh, Ali was in, based in Raqqa and was getting money from Trinidad, local Trinis and distributing it to the, the Trini ISIS fighters in, in Syria. He was also doing other stuff in, in, in Raqqa, including property development, selling things. Um, Imran Ali was then, so he, he's now been... Uh, extra, he, he's been taken back to to America and appeared before a Florida court on charges of material support for ISIS. Now, the really interesting thing about Imran Ali is his kid, Jihad Ali. Um, they're related, as I mentioned, to, to Anissa Wahid and, and Imam Nazim Mohammed. Now, Jihad Ali went to Syria when he's 14. Within months of arriving, he goes to Raqqa. They get he goes to Raqqa with his father. They get vetted and he gets given some serious military training, including experience with AK-47s, RPGs, all of that stuff. He even fought to the last moment in Baghouz, 
Um, this is 15, 16 year old who has um, significant experience, who probably has been brutalized by those experiences. Now, what do you do with somebody like that? That's a serious question. Um, so, so I think um, there's other cases. I mean, there's another case of a Trini kid um, who had killed someone on camera in a video, a young boy, 14, 15 year old boy. Um, I believe based on a couple of reports, I think he's, he's, he's among those in the camps in, in Syria right now. What do you do with somebody like that? Um, it's a serious it, question. It, it, it strikes me there's very few, like in the debate, and the debate obviously is playing out in Europe right now. I think there's a big spread in the Times today about Biden urging repatriation. Um, of course, it's easier for the US to advocate repatriation because they've got the laws to deal with this. But as you mentioned, Trinidad and a lot of European countries don't have that. So I think there's, there's, there's very few people willing really to face how complex morally and legally this problem is. It's kind of, it's kind of oh, you know, they were misled and groomed on one side or, or you, know, you know, leave them there to rot on the other. And actually, there's, there's a massive categorization of different categories of people and offenders mm. within that as well. And and the strength of our, the robustness of our own laws in dealing with that is is massively very well. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then you've got other cases like a uh, kid called Sule Su, the son of Galon Su, who was taken to Syria um, by his mother, who, not even a Mus not a Muslim. Um, and uh, Josie Ensor did a very nice story on this, so a very sweet kid, and, and you're kind of thinking... Well, you know, he's a world away from the kind of jihad alleys. Um, should the Trinidad state just leave someone like that, um, you know, wash their hands of, of somebody like that? That clearly seems morally wrong. Um, but there are difficult moral issues, difficult practical issues. Can Trinidad, does Trinidad have the resources and the, 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 the expertise uh, to deal with this issue? Do they, you know, you got 60, possibly 60 kids who are going to be, who will have been brutalized. I mean, does it have the resources to deal with that? And then the other question is that Trinidad is a relatively small country. And so where do these kids go? So Emran Ali, he has a wife, uh, Sulema Aziz, who's currently in Syria. They have some, uh, they have some other kids, right? Um, does his wife just go back to the Booz settlement in Rio Claro and just think, you know, well, I had an interesting kind of ex extended gap gap yeah um now i'm back in trinidad i'm just going to chill out and um eat doubles i mean what what does that look like um these communities are still kind of they're still radical milieus to an extent so if these people are repatriated where do they go do they go back to these communities in diego martin Guanas, and rio claro or are they to be separated from from their family um and, and from these communities, I mean, that's a difficult question. And you can see how political and politicized that would that would be if these kids are brought back. I mean, actually speaking on the, the Trini state capacity and the security capacity, um, I, you're, I think Keith Haywood, who you, you know pretty well has asked the question. So he's, um, he's asking, you know, given that there was a coup in 1990 and we've had radical networks and uh, you know, groups, group, groups for a while, were the security services the, to, to use a, to use it down with the kids term did they sleep on this threat did they were they were they not alive enough to this threat of people leaving um yeah it's a good question from from my man keith hayward um yeah i think I, I think to some extent i mean part of one thread in the story is this kind of is a kind of tolerance or even kind of sort of indifference to these extremist networks in trinidad i mean so the jam the Jamaat al-Muslimin in 1990 tries to overthrow the, the state um, to resolve uh, this land dispute issue, issue that Abu Bakr had with the state, tries to um, bring about a change in government, and they basically walk away with impunity. Okay, they do two, two years uh, jail time, 24 people were killed in, in the coup, um, huge amount of, of looting, property damage, but they basically walk away from that. Uh, Abu Bakr was then allowed to develop the, his network um, with relative impunity. And in fact, he was sort of in bed with a lot of local politicians in, in Trinidad. Abu Bakr himself describes, describes himself as the, as the kingmaker of Trinidadian politics. 
he so he was um so he was involved in that um the state basically steered clear as far as i can see of nazim's network and allowed him in the south and allowed him to proselytize and 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 do and do what he what he wanted to do um when people started going from trinidad to syria the response the basically the official response of the state was that's fine um in fact it's probably a good thing that we get rid of um people like Shane Crawford so instead of shooting up the streets of Shaguanas they can they can get it on in Syria and they're probably going to die and we won't have anything to do with them anymore um i think that was probably i could em- empathize with, with with that view in some respects but it proved to be quite short um um short sighted i guess because these guys are also taking their families and children uh and now you have this huge uh returnee problem and and again the 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 trinidad state seems to be um kind of ducking that issue but i do understand their reluctance to deal with it they've got enough problems um going on going on in trinidad right now with gang violence with um venezuelans illegally in, entering the country um you know there's there's uh murders every day on the streets in trinidad so they have a lot to deal with well they're certainly not the only government are really i think that are kind of not really facing this in if you know looking you know confronting this face on or head on um so just just in the last few minutes i um i think uh, yeah just just in the last few minutes so moving away from the book a little bit so um you you hinted at this in one of your recent articles um you wrote an article for unheard i think on the 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 headline was the trivialization of trauma um and that was that was kind of based on some research that you did so you're you're doing some research essentially and this is this is going to sound weird to some people but into gore porn so i'm wondering if you can just give like a uh, a quick kind of sneak preview of what what the next simon cotty project is after this and not that everybody everybody else should obviously go and buy this book and read it cover to cover but what what's the next big thing in the pipeline yeah this book is on it's a leave the human funded project on the mass dissemination of the jihadi execution video is really about how different audiences engage uh and make sense of uh what i call uh jihadi gore porn uh, so i'm talking about beheading videos um in the main and so i look at these different online kind of um fan groups of of isis videos i mean strangely on internet gore sites there's there's quite a vigorous sort of secular isis fan base that was circulating isis videos and, and watching isis videos because of the kind of the because of a voyeuristic interest in watching people get beheaded and so there's this weird kind of uh, subculture around those videos i was also interested in in the kind of um a different kind of subculture among counter extremism people and experts and how they relate to jihadi execution videos and of course they re- relate to to those videos in a very different way and then i interview i carried out a whole bunch of focus group interviews with um young muslim adults in in london and showed them isis videos and got them to talk about those videos so it kind of draws on draws on that it's really about the the seductive the seductions and repulsions of of um jihadi snuff really mm. i'm not sure if i'm selling that no i mean i mean it's 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 not something i've come across so you're selling it just in, in that <laughs> in that respect anyway but i think i mean most most people have seen a nicest execution video even if it's not a requirement for their job but that's haven't you done some re- previous research showing that that like a a hell of a lot of people have have sought out this content just out of kind of a like you said a voyeuristic impulse or a, or kind of morbid curiosity yeah no absolutely and and part part of the the reason for doing the book is to understand how what kind of impact if any that has on people i mean because it's the broader kind of narrative around this is that online watching online slick isis propaganda is radicalizing in some way you know the people are vulnerable to 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 this material and will somehow be bewitched by it or demonically possessed by it and so uh, all the interviews i've been doing with with people who watch this stuff um sheds a sort of different light on it and from excitement as a response to disgust 
And in fact, one of the, the, the least common response is fear. The most common response among people I've interviewed is, is this sense of revulsion and, and excitement. Um, so it, it's, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's kind of ambiguous, the disgust and, and excitement. I, I, at the same I mean, that, time. that, that, that that reflex is, is probably a little bit different from what we heard a lot in the media and, and from analysis of ISIS propaganda, like Debate magazine, you know, a lot of people were saying this was, this was to radicalize or this was to like scare people at home. But actually you're saying that the main reflex is, is one of disgust. And, and actually that was deliberate on their part as well to, that's what they want to elicit, that reaction of disgust. Yeah, or yeah, some sense of violation or, or euphoria among supporters. Um, but the euphoria is not just shared among ISIS supporters because uh, you have a whole bunch of secular online core fans who are get, getting off on this kind of material, but also using it in a political way as if to suggest, look, this is the true face of Islam. Look how terrible Muslims are because they're doing these beheading videos. I think that's an interesting thread that comes out in, in, the, in, in the current research is how these videos can be politicized by the far right to kind of suggest, you know, this is what's really going on. Uh, so there's this strong vein running through the core sites of, of free speech. And this is, we need to know who our enemy is. Um, so that's good. That, that's kind of interesting to look at that. But it, these videos permit multiple interpretations. It's not just this, um, you know, ridiculous idea that you watch an ISIS video and become radicalized by it. Um, it generates lots of uh, conflicting and, and, multi and multiple responses that can't just be reduced to some bullshit about vulnerability and and um, radicalization, you know. Well, I think uh, I think we could probably have another hour to talk about like the medicalization and the pathologizing pathologizing of uh, of joining a terrorist group. But we're I think we're out of time. So, um, have you got any final sign off thoughts that you want to conclude on? Um, I don't think I, I don't think. Although, Apart from by the book. Tell everyone to buy the book. Yeah, it can be purchased at all at all reputable bookstores and, and also on Amazon. <laughs> well, um, well. You can, yeah. I think, you can already get some. Some people have been selling it on eBay already. Uh, I don't know if you've Fair already is. sold That's... sold your copy, Liam. The, I think that was Rash. That I, I gave that was you. That was definitely Rash. <laughs> <laughs> He's listening. Uh, yeah. on eBay. Uh, yeah. Somebody said he haven't seen it on Amazon US. Um, have a look on Amazon UK. It's definitely on there. And I think on like Waterstones and stuff like that, you can get it. Um, I'm pretty sure you can get it on Kindle as well. So if people have got a Kindle, they can, they can get it uh, if they're in, a, in the US or something. Um, so yeah, so um, I think we, we'll wrap it up there. Um, we've broadcasted live on YouTube. We've had, uh, we've had a good number of people in the chat with us and dropping questions in. Um, so thank you so 